Lord, we ask that you would bless our evening tonight with an abundance of good gifts and graces. Show us your mercy. Overwhelm us with your with the abundance that you have in store for us. Lord, we thank you in advance for all that you will do. In Jesus' holy name, amen. And in the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. So what we just did right there, right, not just singing and singing the way we did, but then this idea that let's stop and let's be open to have the Lord communicate to us and communicate in a way that says we can understand what God's saying and we can speak it out to others. That's a pretty striking thing. It, it's based on the reality that God is the living God. He sees us. He knows us. He knows what we're doing here. And he's a part of it. In fact, he's the basis of it. And that might not sound too startling to you all, but for typical followers of Christ, typical Catholics, not really thinking that the living God is knocking on the door of your heart in order to speak a word to you that he intends for you to bring to others. How many of us are living in that sort of way, right? So coming together like this in this group can be a beautiful opportunity to grow in that sense of faith expectation, that sense of awareness and alertness that the living God sees you, knows you, is knocking on the door of your heart, is moving within you, and wants to move through you into this world with his word. Wow. That's a pretty dramatic and exciting thing. Yeah. Right? Thank you, Jane. I was waiting for that. I'm like, <laughs> is anybody, is it anybody excited? I mean, that's a pretty exciting thing. And, thank you. It's about time. <laughs> But I want to say there's a word tonight. If there's a, a theme for, the, uh, for tonight, there's a particular word. And you're going to like tonight's word a lot better than last Tuesday's word. Okay. Who's here last Tuesday? What was last Tuesday's word? Suffering is one way of saying it, right? Give me another word. Praiseworthy desperation. Okay. Who came away with the new favorite phrase, right? I didn't even give you the, the way that um, Bonaventure talks about it. I'm going to give that to you tonight. You're going to love that, right? It's the prayer of groaning. Okay, there you go. The word I was looking for was powerlessness, right? Um, so tonight the word is power. Okay, who likes that word better, right? Like, why couldn't we begin there, right? Why couldn't we begin with the word power, right? Well, we don't get to begin with power. One of the things that we learned is that the power of God comes through the doorway of our powerlessness. And we don't like that. We don't like that. Can't you just kind of drop the power of God down on us? Like, boom. I don't want to have to experience the powerlessness, the, the radical sense of incapacity to be the door, the funnel, the vessel through which his power is at work. But that's not the whole story. So we're going to do some interactive group activity. So there is a, a, a concept in, um, in moral theology and spiritual theology called virtue, right? And virtue is not an easy word to define. Okay? So virtue means human excellence on display. So when you say someone is virtuous, it's that they're displaying in action that which manifests human excellence. Isn't that cool? But there's a Latin root. If you say, what is the Latin word that virtue comes from? It's virtu. The word virtu means power. Power. And so there is a way in which power comes into our lives when we act in accord with the virtues. Now, there are certain categories of virtues. Okay, this is all going somewhere, don't worry. Okay, this is interactive. Uh, there are virtues that are called theological, and there are virtues that are called cardinal virtues. Who can give me a theological virtue? John is waiting, he's, he's got this. Faith, hope, and love. Now, that, that was a very prudent thing to do. Prudence is one of the cardinal virtues. 
What are the other cardinal virtues? Can you just give me one of them? Prudence. What else? Justice. Temperance. Well, are you are you are you people Catholic? Did you go to Catholic schools? Fortitude. Fortitude. You got that from John. I I, so, I know you got that from John. Okay. Now, prudence, justice, temperance, and fortitude are the four cardinal virtues. Okay. Now. Uh, cardinal means hinge, a hinge virtue. And what that means is in the theology of the virtues, virtues give rise to other things. So if you want to um, experience a certain uh, virtue that's a lesser virtue, it's going to be attached to one of these cardinal virtues. Like the deadly sins are called capital sins because they're the head or source of other sins, right? So the cardinal virtues are fundamental to a life of virtue, a life of moral virtues, intellectual virtues, etc. Okay, um, the specific aspect that is associated with cardinal virtues is that they are acquired. They're called acquired virtues, which means if you want to grow in courage or fortitude, do what? Act courageously. If you act courageously, you will acquire some courage. And if you continue to act courageously, you'll continue to grow in courage. Okay, different than the theological virtues. Theological virtues are not acquired. Who knows the $5 word for the type of, uh, the, the way in which the theological virtues reach our lives. Goodies. They're given, right? but what's that word given? What, what's another, what's a, what's a, that's a 25 cent word for given. They are... John knows. He's going to show off. Infused. They're infused. Everybody nod like you knew that one from the catechism, right? They're infused virtues. And when are they infused into us? In baptism. In baptism, they are infused into us. In other words, you cannot acquire faith by saying, I believe, I believe, I believe, I believe. That is not going to get it done. Okay? They are infused into us. That means they are a gift. They're a gift that God gives to us. Now, what's distinct about faith, hope, and love are that they show us how we relate to God. So they're not just things that live in us. Oh, I have faith, hope, and love inside of me because they've been infused in me. No, they actually describe how we relate to God. In other words, you are always in your relationship to God exercising one of those modes of relating. You're always manifesting faith, hope, or love when you're relating to God. Think of any way that you relate to God. You'll be able to associate it with faith, hope, or love. So let's talk about that in terms of um, let's talk about that in terms of um, like what does what do each of these words mean, and then relate them to we're going to ground them immediately in what we've been doing here, okay? Because you're going to discover that what we're doing here is an attempt to stir and develop our relationship with God, which means stir and develop faith, hope, and love, okay? What is another word for faith? What's another word for faith, Abby? Uh, These are not trick questions. These are not trick questions. Belief. belief is a good word, right? To say, I have faith, I believe, right? So an element of faith, one of the important aspects of faith is saying, I believe. I believe that God exists, and I believe certain things about God. Is that the deepest center? Is that the uh, the ultimate core and center of faith? Say no. No, it is not. <laughs> so I want you to find a better word to describe the ultimate center, the essence of what it is to say, I have faith in God. What's that word? Yeah. Trust. <laughs> <laughs> Man, I like the enthusiasm. I like the enthusiasm, Ann. Who said trust? Did someone say trust back here? You did. Okay, thank you. So faith, faith is, is unlimited trust, okay? And even more profoundly, self-entrustment to God. 
It's an unlimited trust and entrustment of oneself, all that I am, all that I have, all that I believe, into God's hands. Faith is trust. Okay, what's hope? What's another word for hope? Anybody have enough confidence to answer that? <laughs> yes. So if faith is unlimited trust, let me give you a way to pray faith. Lord, I believe in you freely, completely, and forever. I believe in you freely, completely, and forever. I trust and entrust myself to you freely, not forced, completely, not partially, and forever, not just for this moment. That's faith. Another way of describing um, faith is a prayer of abandonment, a prayer of surrender. Those are prayers of faith. I put myself into your hands, Lord. Okay. Hope is confidence. But it's not just confidence like, okay, buckle up. Everything's going to be okay. I've got confidence. I hope, I hope, I hope. Right? No. It's confidence in a person. It's confidence in Jesus and in all that he has promised to you. And so a prayer of hope is, Jesus, I hope in you. I, I have confidence in you and in all that you've promised to me, that what you have promised, you will fulfill. For you are faithful to your promises. So hope is having this unlimited confidence that looks to you, Jesus. Okay, what about love? What's a word for love? Another word for love, the word in Latin that's used to describe the Holy Spirit in Thomas Aquinas' Summa Theologica, he says each of the persons of the Trinity can be associated with another concept to try to understand who the Holy Spirit is. So the Holy Spirit is spirit, is a person of God, and that spirit could also be described as love. And the word he uses for love is delight. Delight. To say that God says, I love you, is to say that the Lord says, I delight in you. Isn't that beautiful? Because love can mean so many different things. But to say that you've known the one who created you takes delight in you, finds a, a, a sense of joy. He, he takes joy in you. The, the word in Latin is delectare. Isn't that a great verb, delectare, to delight? Delectare. And the root meaning of delectare is a nursing mother. Lect, the, the, uh, the concept of milk. And delight is... A mother nursing a child, a mother nursing a little baby. Okay, now ask the question. Is delight the experience of the mother who's nourishing the child, or is delight the experience of the child being nourished by the mother? Yes. Isn't Catholic theology cool? This is so cool. To say that God delights in you, do you know what God delights in? God delights in you, delighting in his delight of you. Whoa. Do I need to say that again? Mike, did you lose that? You, you track it, you track. Mike's like, okay, how many delights were there? God delights in you receiving his love. Because now his love has come to fulfillment. His love actually is nourishing you. His love is making you come alive. Okay. Virtue, theological virtues. These are things that God has given to you. He intends you to be alive, to be flourishing, to be full of faith and hope and love. So I didn't tell you this, but all that we've been talking about the first two weeks were love and faith. I don't know if you knew that. I just told you now. Is that I, 
I've just been telling you, the first week was all about, you remember, what's the dynamic of being a disciple? The first moment in the life of a disciple is the moment of the call, right? There's the moment of the call. And we described that that was, first of all, the call into existence, remember? To be is to be addressed by God in love. Oh, love, there it is. I did say it, but you, maybe you didn't get it. This was all about the fact that God's addressing you in love. He delights in you, and he wants you to know that delight, receive that delight, live in that delight. That's what he wants for you. One way that I encouraged you to pray, one way that I encouraged you to pray to experience God's delight in you is to go before Jesus in prayer, maybe in front of the Blessed Sacrament, maybe in the scriptures, maybe in your own quiet time is to say to Jesus, who am I to you? Who am I to you? You want your life to change? Give Jesus permission to reveal to you who you are in his heart. When you know who you are in his heart, when he reveals to you who you really are, you're revealed as one whom he loves. You're revealed as one who's this precious gift that he's planted in this moment in history to be his and to do his work. That's our call. And so part of what we're doing here is to simply recover and get stirred into flame that gift of love. It already exists in you. But to get it to be stirred alive so that we actually know and encounter and live in that love and then we can respond, I love you, Lord. I love you because I've been loved. Because I've been loved, I love you. Okay, we go from call to what was that second moment last week that none of us really liked too much? Powerlessness, praiseworthy desperation. Or in the words of Bonaventure, the prayer of groaning. The prayer of groaning. And... Um, but I, I said this, that you can look it up. It's in his uh, greatest of works in, on prayer. It's called The Soul's Journey into God, right? The Soul's Journey into God. He says, the beginning of the journey is the prayer of groaning. Help! He says, it's Daniel in the lion's den. That's where prayer begins. Prayer begins with Daniel in the lion's den, a man of desires. Get me out of here. Help! I'm going to get slaughtered. Right? But he says that there's actually a prayer that precedes the prayer of groaning. What is that prayer? It's the prayer of groaning over not groaning. Whoa! Okay, Bonaventure, you kind of blew me away there. Let me kind of think about that. Okay, what does that actually mean? Groaning over not groaning means essentially that everything's going fine. I don't need to groan. I don't want to groan. I remember that one moment I had to groan, and I don't like that, and let's avoid that, Lord. <laughs> let's kind of stay far from that. And Bonham is just like, no. No, 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 no. Remember the, the doorway of God's power is through his powerlessness. So if you're not groaning over what's happening in this world, you're not paying attention. Right? All we have to do, if there's not something in our lives that drives us to our knees and makes us feel helpless, it makes us feel desperate in a way that turns us to God, okay, just pay attention to the people around you. Right? You don't have to go very far before you bump into conditions where you will fall down on your face before God and say, help, we are desperate. We need you, God. And so when God's people become awakened, they'll become awakened in part by coming to know God's love. But part of us is going to become awakened by groaning over not groaning. Groaning over the fact that so many people go to church and don't get it. Does that cause us any suffering? Right? Well, no, we're very comfortable. Well, pray. This is, if the first prayer was, Lord, who am I to you? Who am I to you? This other prayer is, Lord, conquer in me all that resists you. Lord, give me the grace to groan over not groaning. 
and then see what God will do. But lose my phone number. Okay, I don't want to go on with you. <laughs> that was a joke. Come on, Moira got it. Thank you. All right. So that's where we ended up last week. Okay. Now we're going to get to this week. So if we covered hope, I'm sorry, we covered love, delighting in the Lord. Now we covered faith, trusting in Jesus. Jesus, I trust in you. Oh, another prayer is Jesus, you take over. Jesus, I got nothing. Jesus, I surrender myself to you. Take care of everything. That's a prayer of powerlessness. We're now going to move to, what's the third virtue? Hope. We're going to talk about confidence. And that's where we're going to look to the Lord to experience his power. We're going to look to the Lord to experience his power coming through our powerlessness to fill us with the power of the Holy Spirit. Okay? Before we do that, though, I'm going to get you guys more active. Okay? The way I'm going to get you active is I've got a handout. And this handout is of a meditation by St. John Henry Newman. Okay? And it's a powerful meditation that he wrote when he was groaning. Okay? So, brilliant theologian, 19th century, teaching and uh, as he was studying Anglican theologian at Oxford, here he is studying, all of a sudden he realizes, I have to become Catholic. And so he, who had this prestige and this position, who was um, extremely uh, looked to, uh, had all this esteem and honor, becomes Catholic, and all of a sudden loses everything, loses his friends, loses his status. And now he's feeling like, wait a minute, all you people that said we'd welcome you in, they keep a distance because this is, is his conversion real? Maybe he'll go back to being an Anglican again, keep him at a distance. And all the friends that he had were like, whoa, hey, what have you done? Are you crazy? All of a sudden, he's following God's plan, following God, and all of a sudden, God's led him into this place where he is powerless, desperate, and groaning. Sounds like Paul. Sounds like Paul, exactly. Lying, being led along. Ah, I thought I was doing God's will, and here I am. So I'm going to have you guys read this in the small groups, okay? God is doing a million things in any one thing. So God had John Henry Newman write this for you tonight. One of the reasons that God wrote this the way, had him write this the way he wrote it was because he wanted you to hear that tonight. Whoa! 150 years later, right? And John Henry Newman didn't know that. The, the actual original was, yo, God, you all complete, let's go. <laughs> Come on, Carrie, come on. You got to pray, like, extend hands and pray for Carrie so she lives with, right? She's so, like, do it here because you're not, no one's laughing at home. No one, no one's going to walk home. Again. She, she's just like, don't laugh. You're just going to encourage them, right? Don't feed the animals. All right. So let's, let's dive in now to uh, the, the theme of the Holy Spirit as God's power, okay? We're going to move into the theme of hope. Remember now, hope is confidence, because confidence is you haven't yet received the fulfillment of the promises, but you're confident that Jesus who made the promise is going to fulfill the promise, right? And so that hope is the, is the virtue that is proper to someone who's alive on earth, because we're on the way. Fundamental to the structure of being a human being is that we live our lives on the way. We're not yet home. Any sense of home that we have here is a foretaste of the home that we're made for that comes in heaven after we die through death, beyond death. So that means that we're going to experience this sense of unfulfillment. So even in faith, Lord, I trust you freely, completely, forever. No, I don't. I just don't. I'm not there yet. There's a gap. Lord, I love you with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength. No, I don't. There's a gap. There's that gap that exists between what I say, what I'm called to say, who I am most truly and fully, and how I actually am. And that gap can be pretty discouraging. But that gap is actually... What Aquinas says, a sign of our nobility. Ooh. He says it's a sign of the nobility of a creature that they require help 
from the outside to achieve their proper end. What? Hey, I told you you were going to get some theology. What help does a rock need to be a rock? None. What help does a dog need to be a dog? None. What help do you need to be fully the human being God created you to be? A whole bunch. And Aquinas says, that's a sign of your nobility. It's a sign that you actually have a higher status in God's creation because you can't achieve the end for which you were created apart from help from the outside. That's how God made us. That's how God made us. And so that's a beautiful gift. It's a beautiful gift that God is saying, I called you to be my children, and I intend to give you the power you need to guess what? Be able to close that gap when you say, I trust you freely, completely, and forever. Yeah, the power of the Holy Spirit will close that gap. I love you with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength. Yeah, it's the power of the Holy Spirit that will fill that gap and allow us to come into that kind of love. Okay, now, what about that hope, which is the Holy Spirit? What does that look like in our spiritual lives? Well, when did Jesus talk about a promise to send power in the form of the Holy Spirit that would then give them the ability to do what he intended them to do? When was that? The ascension. The ascension. It was coming. He was, he was right there. He was right there. At the ascension, right? Remember, he said, go be my witnesses throughout the end of the earth right now. No. He said, go, wait. Wait for the, wait for the promise of the Father. The Holy Spirit, the promise of the Father. When he comes to you, then you'll be my witnesses throughout the ends of the earth. Through Judea, Samaria, and throughout the ends of the earth. And so don't try to be a witness without the power. And so why are we here? Why are we here? Why are we here? We're here because too many of us, Catholics and other Christians, are doing what? Trying to fulfill the call without the power. Trying to fulfill the call without that fulfillment of the promise being fully alive in us. So the Holy Spirit who's been given to us needs to be set free. Needs to be stirred into flame. Needs to be, what? The power needs to be unleashed, yielded to. So in the course of the weeks to come, we're going to learn how to begin praying with that sense of expectation for a release of the Holy Spirit, for a new experience of his power, so that we can fulfill the call that is ours. Call, powerlessness, empowerment. I want to give you just two examples. Two examples from lives of saints that are going to give us the way to live out what the apostles did. What did the apostles do when they heard that? Where did they go? Mm-hmm. Upper room, right? They went to the upper room, and what did they do? They waited, and they prayed. And then they waited some more, and they prayed some more. What do you call a waiting form of prayer? What do you call a form of prayer, a type of prayer, where what you're doing is waiting? It's called Vigil. To wait in a moment of prayer before God where you haven't achieved fulfillment, it's called being vigilant in prayer or vigiling in prayer. And so that's what they did. They made the first what's called novena, right? The first novena is a novena to the Holy Spirit, a novena for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And so they pray from Ascension Thursday through Pentecost Sunday. Boom! Here comes the Holy Spirit. And then they go and they're witnesses. Okay. Who was a great saint of vigiling? St. Philip Neri. St. Philip Neri. So St. Philip Neri, 16th century, right? You knew that? You didn't know that. Okay. He He is the apostle of joy. He's the apostle of joy. Do you know how he evangelized? Let's get the band. Let's get out on the street. Woohoo! He dressed up, danced around. Everyone came. And said, what is going on? And they brought him right up into the church, and then he'd preach. Okay, but that's not how he started. That wasn't how he started. Because we're going to dance down Madison Road. Let's go. <laughs> Debbie's like, okay, time for this group to end. Dance on out of the house. Not at all. Okay, 
Where did it begin? It didn't begin on the streets of Rome. It began in the catacombs of Rome. Ooh. What are the catacombs? The burial grounds, right? The, the underground burial sites of, uh, of Christians. And so Philip Neri went there. And do you know when he went there? In the days leading up to Pentecost. He was doing a novena to the Holy Spirit. And he prayed and waited, prayed. And he cried out for hours, come Holy Spirit, come Holy Spirit, come Holy Spirit. And what happened? The Holy Spirit came. And he describes it. The Holy Spirit came like a ball of fire. And this ball of fire, what did it do? It entered his mouth, went down into his chest, into his heart. And his heart became so inflamed, he was so caught up in the fire of the Holy Spirit, he fell to the ground and started rolling around. And he was crying out to God, relent, relent. Do you want me to translate that in modern English? Back off. <laughs> it's too much. It's too much. He experienced the too muchness of God. Have you ever experienced the too muchness of God? How about you pray beginning tonight to experience the too muchness of God? How about you ask St. Philip Neri to pray for you to have an encounter with the Holy Spirit that was like his? Okay. Now what happens to his heart? Thank you for asking, dear. That was good. Help, right? She's going to be very helpful. So his heart, they found out after his death, became enlarged, larger than normal. So large, in fact, that his ribs cracked and his rib cage expanded to make room for this enlarged heart. And his ministry then changed with this power of the Holy Spirit. He began to get followers who were drawn to him magnetically, right? The experience of love, Augustine says, to love is to be drawn. You are loved by God when you are magnetically drawn to God. And so when God's love started radiating from the life of St. Philip Neri, the followers were drawn to him. And when his followers would say, I'm feeling these intense temptations, I'm feeling just overwhelmed, he would just draw them close to his heart. And the temptations would wash away because they'd feel that fire, that warmth that came from him. Whoa. Now what happens when someone's life is filled with that kind of fire? We're going to learn about another saint. St. Seraphim of Saroth. Another favorite, I'm sure, of all of yours. Amy's like, what is this? Okay, a great Russian saint, 19th century Russian saint. And he vigiled. He didn't just vigil over the course of a number of days. He vigiled for 10 years. 10 years. <laughs> he was in a monastery, a cloistered monastery. And he, too crowded went and lived in a hut, and he would spend the night kneeling on a rock, crying out to God, waiting God's Holy Spirit, okay? So 10 years he did that. Now, he gained such a reputation for holiness that people would come to gain wisdom from him. One day this person had sought out wisdom from all these other holy people, could not find an answer, traveled to Sarov to get wisdom from St. Seraphim. He arrived at the monastery. They said, go check out at the hermitage. He was walking around looking for him, couldn't find him. And he came upon St. Seraphim sleeping on the ground in the middle of the day. No wonder he's up all night yeah. kneeling on the rock. <laughs> Saw him sleeping, looking at Seraphim. He gained the illumination. He received the insight to his burning issue, 
without even talking to him, got his answer and left. That person's full of the Holy Spirit. How full? Story is, one winter, he's out chopping down a tree with one of his disciples. It's snowing out. They're getting wood. The disciple says to St. Seraphim, how do I know that the Holy Spirit's alive in me? How do I know? And St. Seraphim goes off and starts speaking this beautiful theology of the Holy Spirit, how you can know the indwelling of the Spirit. And the disciple gets frustrated and says, I don't get it, I don't get it. And St. Seraphim is chopping away and he says, let me tell you some more. And he he explains again, beautiful, beautiful discourse. And the disciple says, I don't get it. He's just, Seraphim puts down the ax, takes him, turns him to himself, says, look me in the eyes. Look me in the eyes. And the disciple who tells the story says, I looked into his eyes. And at first I didn't just saw his eyes. And then all of a sudden, in the back of his eyes, I began to see this flame. And this flame got bigger and bigger. And all of a sudden, it was he was engulfed in this light and this heat. And it became bigger. And it was overwhelming. And he had to break off. And Seraphim says, now do you know? And the disciples said, when they looked around, all the snow had melted where they were standing. <laughs> okay, now... Those are two saints, all right? Those are just two saints. Well, two, we can give 200 more examples, but these are two saints who said, I'm going to vigil. I'm going to come before the Lord in hope, confidence that the Lord is going to fulfill his promise in my regard. And I'm going to pray that that Holy Spirit, remember what the nun prayed for and then the blind priest told me in the first night was what? Pray to become Fire and a sponge, a fire like the burning bush, consumed but not destroyed by the fire of God. And like that sponge full of the Holy Spirit, the living water that fills to overflowing. Here's my encouragement to you as we finish up tonight. My encouragement is that you will begin a vigil in your way, not like Philip, You don't have to go to the cemetery, but maybe set aside a little bit of time, a little bit of time, and start vigiling for the Lord to pour forth his spirit on you and to stir his spirit into flame in you. Now, I've already given you a prayer to pray related to the call, which is, Jesus, who am I to you? Who am I to you, Jesus? I've given you a prayer of desperation. Jesus, you take over. I abandon myself to you. Take care of everything. Now I want to give you a prayer of vigiling in hope. And it's, God, shock me with your generosity. Shock me with your generosity. That's a prayer of hope. That's vigiling. God longs to pour gifts into you more than you long to receive them. And God longs to, here it is, fill you to overflowing. Heaven is being filled to overflowing. Not even a little bit of capacity left over. Pray that you would experience the Holy Spirit in such a way that you would cry out, relent, enough, too much. Pray that you would become a burning bush of the definitive theophany, the way that the Catechism describes the Blessed Mother. That you'd be like that. That you would become fire. Pray that you would be vigiling in such a way that God would overwhelm you far beyond what you imagine. What um, God the Father revealed this to, everyone's favorite saint, Saint Matilda of Magdeburg. (laughs) Come on. Amen. Go Saint Matilda. And you all know Saint Matilda. And it was, it was, the Father says, I love, when my children expect great things from me, for I will far overwhelm them beyond what they imagine and ask for. Come to know that as your God. But if we knew that God, guess what we would do? We would start going forth. When we experience Pentecost, the promise of the Father in our lives, we won't be stopped. 
I'm going to give you three fruits, three fruits, and then I'll be done. Sorry, I said I was going to be done. I get time for three fruits. The first, comes from the catechism, is the purification of memory. Whoa. When the Holy Spirit gets stirred within us, when the Holy Spirit gets released within us, we'll experience a purification of memory. Now, why is that important? Well, the catechism puts it this way. It's paragraph 2853. The paragraph says, the catechism says, that we don't have the power, we don't have the power not to feel or to forget when someone has offended us. So hear that again, right? We don't have the power not to feel or to forget when someone has offended us through their sin. Amen? You try to forget, you try to forgive, you try to let it go, but that fifth grade kid that was teasing me, er, I hope he burns. <laughs> In purgatory. <laughs> A really, really long purgatory. <laughs> right? Why? We don't have the power not to feel or to forget when someone offends us. However, the, the heart that entrusts itself to the Holy Spirit, the heart that entrusts itself to the Holy Spirit will experience a purification of memory. Those very memories become cleansed and purified. And does this, are you ready? Turns hurt into intercession and injury into compassion. What? Not only will the Holy Spirit purify the memory, but the very person who hurt you, their very hurt will make you feel compassion. In other words, I was hurt by them. Oh, I'm actually just beginning to taste a sliver of the suffering that must be part of their lives. And the Lord is actually using their hurting me to be a moment where I can begin to suffer with them for their good. Whoa, you know what that's beyond? That's beyond me. That's beyond a human work. It's only the Holy Spirit that can, can turn hurt into compassion and injury into intercession. What? Who does the Lord want you to pray for? The one who's hurt you. You're going to begin to pray for them. Not just suffer with them, but pray for them. That is not a human work. That's a work of God. So our memories can become cleansed and purified. We can actually become redemptively involved in the lives of others through the very hurts that people have offended us. Work of God. The second. The second is that we'll begin to experience the grace we need the power we need to battle and be victorious over the world, the flesh, and the devil, over diversion, distraction, dispersion, over those things that we've already talked about. The grace of Pentecost is, in St. Thomas Aquinas, gratia ad pugnam. How's that for a Latin phrase? Gratia, grace, ad pugnam, pugnacious. It's the grace to battle, the grace to battle. So when we pray for the Holy Spirit to be released within us, we're going to get the strength we need there too, the strength we need to battle against the sin, against the devil. By the way, get ready. The Holy Spirit gets released in your life. Demons are going to come in, and they are going to attempt to distract you. They're going to try to overthrow you. They're going to try to knock you down. They don't want you active. But you will have strength to battle, to win spiritual battles in your life. And the last one, the last one is you will have a fire in you to spread God's kingdom, to speak God's word, to evangelize. We'll actually begin to fulfill the Great Commission, right? They call it the Great Old Mission, right? All we believers, we have this call. We have this call. We can experience the powerlessness, but until we've got the power, we are not going to feel this passion, this desire, this longing to go evangelize, right? Here's the basic transformation. Most of us, the best we get is this. All right, Lord, if you want me to say something, give me a sign. <laughs> Been there? Right? Lord, I'm willing to say something. I'll talk to Chris about you, but give me a sign. Make him say the word Joshua and blink his eye four times. <laughs> right? 
right? And then I'll say something, but I need the sign, right? I, what happens is when the Holy Spirit gets released within you, you have a very different spirit. And here's the spirit. Lord, I'm going to that party and I'm going to say something unless you stop me. <laughs> right? That's the spirit. I'm going to say something unless you stop me. The presumption is I am there and I'm on a mission. Who am I going to talk to? You. Here I go. Woohoo. Darn it. I got stopped. Yeah. Right? That's the spirit of evangelizing. That's the spirit of sharing the gospel. Why? Because Christ is everything. Christ is life. Christ is meaning, mission, purpose, identity. This is what life is all about. What are we waiting for? Well, we're waiting for power. We're waiting for the Holy Spirit. So in weeks to come, we're going to dig further into what it means to have the gifts of the Holy Spirit, what it means to pray for the, for the release of the Holy Spirit. We're going to actually pray for the release of the Holy Spirit. Woohoo! And then watch out. Okay? Let's close in prayer. In the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord our God, we thank you. We praise you for who you are, all that you've done in granting us faith, hope, and love. And we ask, Lord, that you give us trust, confidence, and delight in you in a whole new measure. That even now we pray for stirring into flame the gifts that you have given to us. We pray for those great saints that have gone before us, that have been on fire with you. We pray that they would be praying for us, this great cloud of witnesses, that we would fulfill the part that is ours while we are here on earth, while we are here on stage in this moment. Lord, thank you for what you're doing. We say yes, and we ask that you would shock us with your generosity. In Jesus' holy name, amen. amen. The Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen.